Good morning, church. Happy Palm Sunday to each and every one of you. Yesterday was the kind of day I had in mind for Palm Sunday. It was a glorious day here in southeastern Pennsylvania, perfect by all standards. But today we've been just in this terrific rainstorm, which is going to last all day. Not a good day for a parade. <laughs> but we are together celebrating this um, Palm Sunday. I want to point out my little palm plant here behind me, um, which is which is the best I could do for today. <laughs> anyway, it's great to have you with us. I have a couple of announcements just to remind folks that Thursday evening um, we will be celebrating uh, Monday Thursday. That's this Thursday, April 1st at seven o'clock. And there are just two things that I ask you to have uh, available for that. We'll be on Zoom. Um, I'm gonna ask you to have some bread and either grape juice or wine available for communion. And also a candle. I'm going to ask you to have a candle available. Um, and so really looking forward to seeing you as we um, journey through Holy Week towards, towards Easter. I want to ask if anyone has an announcement um, um, this morning before we begin our Palm Sunday celebration. I noticed that the Kinskis have a really cool palm um, display on their screen. So, um, Deb and Chip, looks great. Any announcements? Good morning, everyone. Hey. Hey, so I disagree. It was an awesome day for a parade. We just had our first parade on Kaleidoscope and made a whole lot of noise. So, parents, I'm really sorry. But the kids seemed to have a really good time. They didn't want to stop. So we actually had a Palm Sunday parade and it was really, really cool. Um, just a couple of quick things. Please remember that if you want to participate in the Life is Sweet campaign that we're doing um, to put some a couple of extra fun things in um, with, for donations for um, the food pantries, please make sure you do that in the coming week um, so that we can get everything out to folks. Um, and uh, I think that's it. Oh, just to say that we will have Kaleidoscope next Sunday, even though it's Easter. So we will have Kaleidoscope. Laura, I want to throw one more thing in yesterday uh, that happened yesterday. Um, you and I were over at the church and we were sizing up what will become our church's community garden. Is that correct? So, yes, we were taking a look at a plot of land at the church that uh, many of us believe we could turn into a community garden. You're gonna be hearing more from me about that very soon. Um, so those folks who have green thumbs or an inclination to gardening or have always wanted to try or you love it but you don't have a space for it, we're gonna have a space and it's gonna be, I think it's gonna be really, really incredible. There's gonna be something for everyone. Um, so again, you'll be hearing more from me in the next couple of weeks, but now that we uh, figured out where it can be, I have the soil to get tested and I think we're going to be on our way. Yeah, that sounds so good. I know that Wences has been just so dedicated to food insecurity and this community garden is one more step in our commitment to helping feed our communities. So stay tuned. Well, again, welcome to this day of palms, of what was in Jesus's day, frenetic excitement and expectation. And let us worship with that same kind of enthusiasm as we now worship God. One bit of um, announcement for technology. We're trying a different microphone placement to get a better sound with the organ. So here's hoping it works. Okay.
Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. Lift up your heads and behold, Christ is in our midst. Let us pray. Gracious God, today as we celebrate the triumphal entry of Jesus into the city of Jerusalem, we are reminded of our own expectations of you. And so often those expectations are unrealistic or even immature. The day we ask that during our worship, our hearts might be stretched, that they might be broken open and filled with insight and wisdom. We pray that our compassion and understanding be enlarged to see well beyond our own self-interests and to find ourselves connecting to the larger mystery and beauty of the world and all of creation. We also pray for a deeper faith not one that is fickle and indecisive, but instead one that is grounded in all that is good, just, and helpful. We pray these things in the name of the one who went before us with faith, courage, compassion, and love, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, our scripture reading this morning comes from yet another one of our eight confirmands. And this morning, um, Lila Rees will be our scripture reader. And Lila and her cohorts just finished their confirmation program. This has been a six month endeavor over Zoom. And um, it's been a fantastic experience. Um, one that we've never done before. Um, but one that I think each of the confirmands um, found valuable. And so we're going to hear from Lila right now as she reads this morning's scripture. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this. The Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door. Outside in the street, as they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, why are you doing, uh, why are you untying this colt, the colt? They told them that Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they bought the colt of Jesus and threw their cloaks on it and sat on it. 
Many people spread their cloaks on the road and others spread leafy branches that had cut in the fields. They, those who went, went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed in the one who comes in the name of Lord, blessed in the coming kingdom of our ancestors, David. Hosanna in the highest heaven, then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And what he had looked around, he had looked around at everything as it was already late. He went out to Bethany with the twelve. Thank you, Lila. Well, each one of us has a story about something we had deeply hoped for that did not turn out the way we thought it would. For some of us, the job we had our heart set upon was never offered to us. For some, a relationship we had hoped would be healed came flying apart instead. For some, an opportunity we'd waited all our lives for never materialized. We all hope. We are a people of hope. And sometimes our hopes are buried deep within us until they are kindled by some event that reminds us of what is truly important to us. As people of faith, our hopes often grow beyond our own personal expectations. We find ourselves hoping for peace and for peaceful communities. We find ourselves hoping to an end of violence between nations and between people. We hope for the inhabitants of the world to have food and clean water. We hope. We were designed to hope. But hope can be a hard thing. It can be so hard, in fact, that we are sometimes prone to sink into doubt, into cynicism, and even at times despair. In September of 1965, a Navy fighter plane that was piloted by James Stockdale was shot down over the skies of North Vietnam. Stockdale parachuted down. He was captured and beaten. He became a prisoner of war for the next seven and a half years. James Stockdale spent those years in a particularly harsh prison called Hoa Lo. And in Vietnamese language, it means fiery furnace. American prisoners of the Vietnam War referred to it as the Hanoi Hilton. And you may remember that the late Senator John McCain was also tortured and held in that prison. Stockdale and some of the prisoners who were with him at Hoa Lo were known for resisting their captors and they were kept in a special facility near the prison in individual cells. These cells were three feet by nine feet and they had a single light bulb that was kept on around the clock. Their routine life was that of torture. As author Jim Collins writes, Stockdale lived out the war without any prisoner's rights, no release date, no certainty as to whether or not he would even survive to see his family again. And as a prisoner of war, Stockdale was well aware that the North Vietnamese would want to give the impression that they were treating their prisoners in a humane way when in fact they were not. So when James Stockdale learned that the North Vietnamese were going to videotape him to look like a well-kept 
prisoner, Stockdale deliberately beat himself with a stool and cut himself with a razor in order to purposefully disfigure himself. While in prison, Stockdale created a sophisticated secret code that involved a series of tapping sounds in order to communicate with the other prisoners. He also created a system that would help those prisoners deal with their own torture, instructing them on what to say and when to say it during their time of torture. When James Stockdale finally arrived home in February of 1973, he could not stand upright, could barely walk. He became the first three-star Navy officer in US history to have received Naval Aviator Wings and the Congressional Medal of Honor. When asked about how he was able to survive, James Stockdale replied, and I quote, I never lost faith in the end of the story. End quote. Author Jim Collins then went on to ask Stockdale, well, then who did not make it out? And Stockdale then replied, the optimists. Jim Collins was utterly confused by Stockdale's response. And then James Stockdale elaborated, oh, the optimists, oh, they were the ones who said, we'll be out by Christmas. And Christmas would come and Christmas would go. And then they'd say, we'll be out by Easter. And Easter would come and Easter would go. And then Thanksgiving, and then it would be Christmas again. And they died of a broken heart. Walking alongside Jim Collins during the interview, and after a long pause, James Stockdale then said, this is a very important lesson. You must never confuse faith that you will prevail in the end, which you can never lose with the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your reality, whatever they might be. When I think of the day Jesus rode a young colt, some reports say a donkey into the city of Jerusalem, the city that represented the center of religious power for Jews everywhere, I can't help but think about how Jesus must have felt. And what about those, those crowds who gathered around Jesus? Their joyous rumble, those shouts of joy and celebration were bursting with expectation, with a sense of celebration, as if everything they had hoped for was soon going to come true. Were they, as James Stockdale might say, optimists? What eventually unfolded in Jerusalem and with Jesus in particular was certainly what most people did not have in mind. Instead of Jesus sparking a Jewish nationalistic overthrow of Jerusalem in order that Jews might shed themselves of their Roman oppressors, Jesus had come to engage his own religious authorities regarding their own corruption that included collusion with the Roman oppressors. Viewed by religious authorities as an off-the-wall radical and by political authorities as a potential threat to peace and tranquility for the region, Jesus very soon became a convenient enemy to the status quo. Jesus himself seemed to realize long before he entered the city that the journey into Jerusalem would somehow seal his fate. So why did he go? I think because Jesus apparently never lost faith in the end of the story. 
He might have had his moments of doubt and agony. He might have found himself alone and abandoned. But somehow Jesus never lost faith in who he was. Or in the God who held him. Even if Jesus knew or sensed the brutal facts, the brutal realities that surrounded him, the dangers and perils associated with his entering Jerusalem, he went anyway. He never lost faith in the end of the story that nothing would ever separate him ever from God. For so many of us, we hope for certain outcomes in life. And sometimes our hopes do not materialize in the way we had envisioned. And when they don't materialize in the way we had hoped, we can feel abandoned. We can feel betrayed. We can even feel as if God might be punishing us. One of the deepest aspects of our faith is coming to trust God, even when our hopes have been dashed. Even if we're not sure, we even have the wherewithal to trust God. Hope. Hope. Hope is different from optimism. Optimism is a positive outlook. Hope understands the sober realities of life and moves with faith and conviction nonetheless, sometimes even with fear and trembling. The prison James Stockdale spent seven and a half years in was called the fiery furnace. And when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, he was riding into another kind of fiery furnace. But instead of riding into Jerusalem on a war horse, Jesus rode into the city with humility. He rode into Jerusalem without weapons. He rode into Jerusalem with nothing but a rock solid sense that God's word was enough to confront the injustice of oppressive structures that surrounded him. Jesus never lost faith in the story of God, even though he had no idea how and in what way that story would end. And because of that, you and I know the meaning of good news. Amen. Well, as you know, we are continuing our offering for the one great hour of sharing. And so um, my co-pilot this morning uh, is Dave Bickle. Um, Matt McDonald, who was our usual tech wizard, um, had to be away. So go ahead, Dave. All right. We're coming. Here we go. When it comes, everything changes. Children can go to school. Women can start businesses to help support their families. Crops can grow. Neighbors can take care of each other. Markets can thrive. Families can be families. When water comes to a village, everything changes. Water is essential to life and the life of a village. We are giving makes projects like new wells in villages possible. Give to one great hour of sharing 
and let's love you. So one of our, um, so bringing water, which is so precious, is part of what this offering helps to do. So we give you that opportunity to give to the One Great Hour of Sharing through Rebel Give on our website, or you can mail the church a check, or um, you can talk with me, um, and we look forward to um, your giving and your generosity as we help God mend the world. Thank you.
That was really terrific. Um, I sensed a lot of passion in that piece. Um, I think we have a new name for our bell choir. It's the Masked Ringers. So, thank you all, Dave Bickle and everyone who participated um, in that piece. Who would have thought we would be doing this a year ago <laughs> or a little over a year ago, I should say. We've come a long way. Each time we gather, um, I invite us to talk about um, something that may have been very impactful uh, over the course of the last week, something that may have affected you deeply. It could be a joy or a concern, it could be a prayer request. Um, anyway, uh, we take that time um, together in community to share those things. And so I'd like to open it up at this time for you to do so. Simply unmute and share and, um, and then remute when you're finished. Good morning. Um, I just want to be sure that everyone knows that North Penn High School has a walk up COVID vaccine um, event today. Mm -hmm. uh, it started, I believe, at nine o'clock. So if anybody needs the vaccine and is 65 or older, uh, that's the target audience. Thanks, Kathy. Couple of things that I want to share. Um, I was thinking about the juxtaposition of Palm Sunday and um, and the joy um, and the humility of Jesus. And I'm I have that picture in my mind, and I also have um, these images of. Um, of mass shootings. I'm trying to hold those two things um, together. Um, eight people killed in Atlanta, 10 people killed in Boulder, Colorado, among them an on-duty police officer, two dead in Virginia Beach, with eight wounded. I'm really affected by the level of violence. Um, and my sharing today is simply to pray for peace and to continue to follow the Prince of Peace in the midst of so much tragedy. Also, I'm going to remind us of the crisis at the border and prayers for thoughtful and humane resolution. It's a very complex, complicated issue. Um, and I pray for our leaders to have the wisdom and the compassion and the sensibilities to um, be humane. This is the world you and I are living in. Um, 
a world that is yet to be born anew with the promise of new life and resurrection, but one that also does not step away from the sobering realities of life. And so we are that people of hope. Let us pray. O oh, gracious God, whose love spans creation and fills us with love and with light, today we give thanks for the lengths that you will go to stay connected to us, to embrace us, and remain present near and through us. As we reflect on Jesus's journey into Jerusalem, we give thanks for his courage and his compassion and for his ability to not sidestep issues, but to engage them in a way in which the world often loses patience. Oh God, instead of force, Jesus used presence. He used engagement. And what God, Jesus, did so much for us was to paint the picture of how it can be and how it will be if we choose. Oh God, we are a people of quick fixes, fast solutions, instant results, and we get impatient. God, we ask on this day to help us become more and more a non-anxious people, a people of hope. We are a people who can give up too easily, and we become cynical when things don't go our way. So teach us, O oh Lord, teach us how to be a people of hope and not mere optimists as we continue to hold our lives close to the Jesus whom we know and follow, who taught us to pray this prayer in the New England version, New Zealand version, excuse me, Eternal spirit, earth maker, pain bearer, life giver. Source of all that is and that shall be. Father and mother of us all, loving God in whom is heaven. The hallowing of your name echo through the universe. May the way of your justice be followed by the peoples of the world. Your heavenly will be done by all created beings. Your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In times of temptation and test, strengthen us. From trials too great to endure, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you reign in the glory of the power that is love now and forever. Amen. Following our sending and our postlude, I'd like to ask you to stick around so that we might have a proper send off for one another, given the fact that it is Palm Sunday. I think I want to hear a lot. I mean, a lot of cheering. OK, so stick around for that sending uh, at the very, very end. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord, praise ye the Lord, hallelujah, praise ye the Lord, hallelujah, praise ye the Lord, hallelujah, praise ye the Lord.
Okay, everyone, happy Palm Sunday. God bless you. Bye. 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 Bye.